I want you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And uh, we'll begin reading with verse 8. And we're going to, this passage is a little bit longer. We'll read through verse 17. Would you stand in respect for God's Word and love for the Lord Himself as we read uh, this account from uh, Moses? Uh, this morning. Listen to what he says. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pastor, pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, and that they may live in their own place, and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, The Lord will also declare to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me, When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. For your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words... And all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. And you may be seated. I want to say to you this morning that it is always a mistake when you substitute anything in your life for the rule of God. You always pay a price. That is the negative message from 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Now the Bible is going to be honest with you. It's going to tell you the good and the bad. And you need to know, we need to know, that uh, substituting something for God's rule, for the lordship of Christ, is a bad deal. We always pay a price for that. Turn with me, if you will, over to 1 Samuel chapter 8. And we'll uh, start at verse 11. I'm not going to read all of this to you, but I will read the first verse, verse 11. Listen what it says. He said, this will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you, He will take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots and among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. You know what's happening here? Israel had asked God to place a king over them. In other words, they were no longer satisfied for God to rule alone, and so they asked to be like the other nations of the world, to be ruled by an earthly king, a man. And God permitted that in the life of Israel, but He said to them, look, you're going to pay a price, and it'll be your own children that He will place before His chariots. And five more times in that passage of Scripture, the Lord says to Israel, He will take, He will take, 
He will take. He will take. To the last verse, verse 17 of that chapter, he says, And you yourselves will become his servants. Now, anytime the Bible uses the double pronoun, you yourselves, you yourselves, one you is not enough, what he's doing is pointing his finger right at you. He's saying, this is on you. Don't blame God. This is on you. This is your choice. God will let you stray if you want to. He'll let you put something over your life other than Him if you desire it. But you need to know that you pay a price when you do that. Did you know that the average worker in the United States of America pays 58.5% in taxes? Do you know that? That's not just federal tax. That's state tax. That's gasoline tax. That's sales tax. That's all the taxes. Almost 60% of our working lives is spent in subjection to the government. Do you know that? That is up from 2005 where it was 53.2%. Isn't that funny? How that kind of subjection always increases. <laughs> right? You never pay less. You always, always Always pay more. Why? Because the king is a taker. Right? Anything that demands loyalty and uh, 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 rulership other than God over you takes away. So there's something I want you to understand from our passage of Scripture this morning in 2 Samuel chapter eight, verse, verse, uh, chapter 7, verses 8 through 17. Is that God is ready to give. God is ready to provide. All right? He'll make your life matter. I mean, even when you feel worthless... Even if you don't understand where life is heading, He makes life matter. The second thing He'll do is He'll, he'll help you make a difference. Your life will make a difference when He rules over it. And thirdly, He'll guard your legacy. He ensures your legacy that it will endure. Let's first of all talk about how your life will matter when God rules over you, when you allow God to rule over you. Look what he says in verses 8 and 9. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, and made you ruler over my people Israel. That's amazing. It is amazing that when you allow God to rule in your life, that your destiny is set from the beginning and not measured at the end. That is awesome. In other words, God has in mind for you where He is going to take you. And believe you me, He will take you there if you'll just let Him. If you'll just cooperate with Him. If you will obey Him. God's plan and His purpose supersedes everything that happens. All right? All of the events, all of the work, all of the heartache, all of the worry takes a back seat to God's plan and God's purpose in your life. I want to illustrate this to you this morning. I'm going to ask Miss Bertha. Um, Miss, Miss Bertha, do you drive a school bus? Yes. Yes, I do. Do you drive it every day? Every day. Now, she doesn't know what I'm going to ask her, okay? All right? Uh, how many children ride your school bus? Uh, elementary, I've got 60. And middle and high, I've got about 80. 50 and 80. That's 130 kids every day, right? Every day. 
Huh? Every day. Every day. Let me ask you, do all of those kids come to a certain place and you pick them up all together? Yes. Except on rainy days, I have to go to their house and pick them up. Okay, uh, they go to the... Uh, a certain stop, yeah. yes. They go to a bus stop yes. or to their house, right? A uh, bus stop. In other words, they don't go to a central location, but you pick them up where they are. Yes. Right? Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. In other words, you drive a lot of miles going around picking those kids up, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Do those kids all dress the same when they get on the bus? Do they have a uniform and they all dress to look alike? No. That's amazing. In other words, you pick them up where they are and you pick them up how they are. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you another question. Do they all behave? No. <laughs> In other words, they sometimes do what they ought not do. Correct. <laughs> now, I know sometimes you have to discipline them, right? Right. But most times if they misbehave, even though you discipline, you still take them on your bus. You don't kick them off, right? Right, unless oh, they've okay. been rode up two or three times. And oh, you off. ride them up. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's cool. Well, let me ask you another thing. Where do you take them? Uh, to school. To Myers school? Elementary, yeah. Same school every day? Same school. Why don't you take them to McDonald's? I'm not allowed to. You're not allowed to? They try to get me to, but I'm not uh, You don't to. ever stop? You don't ever take a side trip and take them to the mall or anything like that? If they have a field trip, I take them. If they have a field trip. Great. I well, who, de who determines where you're going to take them? Do you uh, determine that? No, the bus shop. Huh? The bus shop that does the routes. The, dust, the bus shop Correct. that does the route. But uh, there's something over the bus shop, right? Is the Hall County... Board of Education involved in that? Correct. So certain school districts, certain kids go to certain schools, right? Correct. Does that ever change? Uh, periodically. Periodically. But most times, you take them from the place where they are to the place where the Hall County Board of Education has determined they're supposed to go, right? That's right. Wow. Isn't that amazing? I submit to you that's exactly what God does. Do you know that? That's what this passage of Scripture says. He says to the, thank you, Miss Bertha. Let's give Miss Bertha a hand. <laughs> what this verse of Scripture says to King David, says to him, I'm going to take you where you are from following sheep from the pasture. And I'm going to put you as prince over my people Israel. Right? Was David perfect? No. Man, he messed up. Right? But did he wind up where God wanted him to be? He sure did. He wound Listen to what the Apostle Paul says about this in Romans chapter 8. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. That's where we're headed, y'all. So that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. From bus stop to bus stop to bus stop to bus stop. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, what? Who can be against us? Our lives are determined under God's rule at the beginning. He's going to take us and He's going to put us off at the place where we're supposed to. To be where he wants us to go. Now, this is, this is amazing to me. This is even more emphatic in Scripture. Listen to what he says. God rules when he is in control. Life's impact is not a part of your choosing 
or your aptitude or your failures or your intellect, your influence, personality, do not control the future. It is not what you do that matters. It is what God does that matters. Okay? I want you to look at verses 8b. Look what it says in verse 8b. It says, I will take you. I took you. 1 Samuel 8, 13. uh, I took you from the pasture. I have been with you forever. Verse 9a. Verse 9a also says, I have cut off all your enemies from before you. And verse 9b says, I will make you a great name. I will, I will, I will, I will. Right? How does that compare with what God said in 1 Samuel chapter chapter 8 when he warned them about the king? What did he say about the king? He's going to do what? He's going to take, he's going to take, he's going to take, he's going to take. I want to tell you, when you give your life over to whatever, if it's not God, if it's of this world, it's going to take. That is a definite comparison in Scripture. The difference between takers and makers. God is the maker. He will make you. He will bless you. He will provide for you. He will eliminate the enemies that stand before you. He will, He will, He will. When everything else in this this life takes and takes and takes and takes. It's the way it is. Earthly powers take away. I want you to understand who's talking here. It is Jehovah. The word that is used is Jehovah Sabaoth, which means the Lord of hosts. God is talking here not as a friend, uh, not as a, a, uh, a, 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 a political leader. He is talking here about the, as the God of creation. The same God that said, let there be light is the one that said to David, I will, I will, I will. I think that's powerful. God's promise is dependable. You can have assurance in Him. He is the all-sufficient, all-powerful, all-knowing, sovereign God who makes your life matter. Look what He says, I will make your name great. There in verse 9, down in the latter part of that verse. I will make your name great. In other words, there's no room here for the self-made man. It's not what you do by pulling yourself up in your own initiative and in your own efforts. It's what God wants to do. And I'm reminded here of Jeremiah's vision of the potter and the clay. You remember that? Jeremiah said uh, uh, that he went down to the potter's house. And there was a potter and was turning the clay on the wheel. And there was a flaw in the, in the clay. Did, did the potter give up? Uh, did the potter just shut down and quit? He remolded that clay and put it back on the wheel and started all over again. Don't tell me you can't start over. You can't begin anew and afresh. The, the, the wisdom of the, of the Lord here demonstrates to us that God is working always in our lives, forming and fashioning us according to His will. It is God who secured David and made His name great. That's what Paul said in Philippians chapter. 2 verse 13, it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Robbie and I have made trips to Alaska. We always like to go. And on some of our trips, we went out and watched the glaciers. Anybody ever seen the glaciers up front and close hand? It's amazing when those things calve and those big uh, ice slides go off into the ocean makes a big wave. 
And if you watch those uh, icebergs, those chunks of ice that, that fall off into the ocean, you'll notice that some of them go one way and some of them go another way. In other words, they don't, they don't follow the same path. They really don't. Because the small ones, the small chunks of ice, are, are blown by the wind. Uh, the pressures of, of the wind current determines which way they go. But then there are some bigger glaciers that go deep down into the ocean, icebergs. You know what determines their direction? The current of the sea. Those deep currents that push those glaciers along their path. And what that teaches us is that there's pressures on us, like wind, that are temporary. The worries that we endure, the, the struggles we go through, those, those winds and those currents that press upon our lives, right? But then there is the deep current. That, that is always steady, always in the same direction, never changes, always dependable, that is more lasting and carries us further than the wind currents that blow against us from time to time. What I want to say to you is that when you trust God and you make Him Lord of your life and He rules over your heart, your life matters because you're going in His direction. He is pushing you along with the deep currents of His love and abiding care. That's pretty good, isn't it? I don't have time to go through the, the next uh, point very much, but I will say to you, because it's kind of similar to this one, that when you trust God and He rules in your heart, your life makes a difference. Look what He says here in verse 11, 10 and 11. I will appoint a place for you, my people Israel, and will plant them, and they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them anymore as formerly, for from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from your enemies, the Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. What does it mean for God to make a place and God to build you a house? What's he talking about? Is he talking about an address? Is he talking about bricks and mortar? You see, it was David's desire to build a house for God. He wanted to build a temple and he wanted to bring the ark into the temple so that it would have a place uh, uh, to rest, a place to be stable where it wouldn't have to move from place to place to place. And God said to, to David, look, since you left Israel, you've had no place, but I have gone with you. And wherever you have been, I have been. Isn't that powerful? In other words, God's presence and God's power is not confined to a specific spot. Mark that down, okay? It's important. Because God identifies and locates Himself wherever His people are. You got it? One of these days we're going to move from this location. You know that? Let me illustrate it this way. Sometimes I'm talking about our church to somebody that, that um, I'm trying to witness to or share with, invite them to come to our church, and they'll say, where is your church located? And I'll say to them, oh, it's located right next door to Loretta's. Okay? They say, I know where that church is. It's the old gas building, right? It's the old gas building. Now, I want to ask you this. What makes this a church when it was built to be a gas building? Hmm? Exactly. 
The people of God dwell here. The people of God come here. And wherever the people of God come, wherever the people of God sit down and make their place, what does God do? He comes right along. He is here with us. That's what makes a church a church. That's what makes your home in your neighborhood different from all the other homes, the non-Christian homes. It's because where you are, that's where God is, and that makes a difference. All right? Got that point? Now I want to lead you to the last point. Everybody say amen. Amen. It's not only that your place makes a difference, but it's that I love this point. The cold chills ran up my spine as I was working on this one. Your legacy endures. Look what he says here in verse 12. When your days are complete and when you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. I mean, it's one thing to let God rule your life and, and to, to know that God is taking you and you're going to wind up where God wants you and that your life matters as He forms and creates you into what He wants you to be. It's one thing to know that, to know that your life is making a difference, that His presence in you calls out that difference as a testimony to His wonder uh, in the face of wickedness and all the things that are happening around us, Right? That's good. But what happens when you die? Brother Doug asked this morning, and said, what do you want written on your tombstone? Says it right here. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendants. He's talking about Solomon here the direct descendant of David. He's talking about that next generation removed. And Solomon did so much for the kingdom of God. You know what all Solomon did? Mark this down. He built the temple that his his father David only dreamed about. He actually got it done. He accumulated great wealth. He extended the borders of Israel far beyond what David was able to do. He built great cities and elaborate mansions. Listen to what 2 Samuel chapter 9 says about Solomon. It says, Thus Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom, and all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind, and he ruled over all. How about that? Solomon didn't go to the Ivy League school, okay? It wasn't the diploma hanging on his wall. It was what God had put into his mind. That's why people sought him out. And he said he ruled over kings from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. And the king made silver, listen to this one, the king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stone. I mean, read that over again in hard economic times. And it says, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of Seraphath. The legacy of children is not determined by their schooling, their occupation, who they marry, or how hard they work. The legacy of your children rests in the one who rules their lives. That's what matters. That's what makes your legacy endure. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me. Look what he says here. Forever in verse 16. He goes far beyond Solomon. He's looking way down the road. And he, he, he envisions the Messiah. Jesus the Christ. And he says your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established 
forever. Isaiah talked about this in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. He said, for a child is born unto us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to his government or of peace on the throne of David. I mean, really, really? Uh, David on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. Do you know how many generations there are between David, King David, and Jesus? Brother Howard, how many? 28. Two multiples of 14. 14 times 2. There are 28 generations. That is 1,002 years. God is talking to David about that which is to come. And he's looking way down the road. How many of you can see that far? I mean, when you think about your children's children and their children, I mean, we can, we can kind of conceive of two or three generations, can't we? Great-grandchildren. The truth of the matter is, is that God promises when He controls, when He rules our lives, it's the best thing we can do for our children. It's the best thing we can do for our children's children. And on down, as far as God can see, the influence of our lives upon them. It's not, I want to tell you, the well-being of this, of this world is not in the hands of science. Uh, it's not in the, I mean, it's not, it's not in the Pentagon. It's not in, in the, the movement of social orders. Governments will rise and governments will fall. But I want to tell you, the children, these precious ones, will be determined and endure. I mean, will this world be here a thousand years from now? It's hard to, hard to know. The truth of the matter is, if it is here a thousand years from now, it's not going to be the same as it is now. Right? God never changes. He's everlasting. His plan and His purpose endure forever, the Bible says here. And the best thing we can do now for those which are yet to be is to make God ruler in our hearts. Because through Him, our legacy endures forever. Have you, ever, have you ever flown standby? I have, and I hate it. You know what it is to fly standby? It's, you don't have a ticket in your hand. Uh, what, what you do when you fly standby is your future, your travel plans rest in the hands of others. If they have a seat, if somebody cancels, if for some reason a seat comes available, then you might be able to get on the plane, right? You might be able to, depending on how many people are in front of you. <laughs> and so what you do when you go to the, to the gate and wait to see if you're going to get on the plane, you just stand there and you hope and you wait. I sat three days, three whole days in Detroit. Waiting for a place on the plane. Okay? Let me, believe me, an airport's not a place to spend the night. Okay? You don't want to be there. Okay? Most times when I travel, I've got a ticket in my hand. What happens when you have a ticket in your hand? You've got a place. Your place is guaranteed. Okay? And so you can just rest. You can even drift off to sleep. You can read a good book or you can have a conversation with your loved one that's sitting next to you or even a total stranger that you just meet there 
You can talk about it and never have to worry because you know when boarding is called, what? You got a place. That's the promise of this scripture today. That God has provided a seat, a place for us. And we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to get stressed out over it. Nobody's going to be in our spot. Our place is secured. Okay? But what? What's, what's that? What's the catcher? You got to get on the plane. <laughs> when the boarding class is called, you got to get on the plane. When you, when you let God rule your life, the blessings of God are just overwhelming. His plan for you is amazing. And His promises are sure and secure. And I want you to respond to that today by letting God have rule in your life. As the Lord speaks to you, you respond as He would lead you today if you do not know Him as Savior. If there's any question in your mind about it, let's settle that before you leave here today. You know? Get on the plane. (laughs) All right? Uh, Get on the bus. I mean, this church is headed on. Okay? And we are on our way. And the Lord is leading us. And we want you to get on the bus with us here at Grace Baptist Church. Thirdly, the, the altar is the place where you need to be. And you need to just make it right with the Lord and rededicate or recommit yourself unto him we invite you to if you're carrying a burden look I know there's burdens out there I know we we don't come to church perfect everything everything uh, in order and where it's supposed to be some of us are carrying burdens today heavy ones you may want to come and just pray about it give it to the Lord we're going to invite you to stand and respond to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to you Uh, in the way that um, he leads you to do this morning. Come on now.